Welcome to Altium Designer PCB Planes. In this module, we will learn about power distribution on the PCB using polygons and power planes. Here we have two simple example PC boards. The one on the right has power planes, while the one on the left employs polygon pores. Looking at their respective layer stackups, we can see for the polygon PCB only two layers, and these are both signals. Looking at the PCB with the added power planes, we see a four layer PCB with two signal and two power plane layers. Using either power planes or polygon pores for low impedance power paths on the PCB is pretty standard. That said, I would suggest using polygon pores over dedicated power planes. Looking at both PCBs, the physical copper is the same continuous pore, with the only difference being with the polygons, you can route other signal traces on those layers. This is not allowed on power planes. With congested layouts, this can enable a PCB with fewer layers employing polygons, rather than having to add extra layers because the power planes do not allow for routing. The other point is that manipulating polygon shapes for distributing multiple voltages is easier relative to power planes. Again, your mileage may vary and your company may require power and ground planes. The good news is Altium Designer fully supports both approaches as well as a hybrid. Let's start with the polygons first. To place a polygon, start at the Place pull down menu and select Polygon Pour. If you had not selected the right layer in the PCB view before starting the polygon pour, at this point, with the polygon pour window open, you can select the layer that you desire. With this layer set, we would now select the net associated with this polygon pour. This is done under the Net Options Connect to Net pull down menu. Starting to type the target net name, uh, in this case I'm typing a G, we'll jump to that location in the list. Now we can select ground for the net. Looking quickly at the Properties section of the window, we have a name entry as well as a checkbox for auto naming. Please consider using at least auto naming to prevent multiple polygons from having the same name. Later, when we're looking at the Polygon Pour Manager, having unique names will be a significant help in identifying the polygons in that window. For now, let's leave it set to auto and we will see the results later. Under the Net Selection is another pull-down menu that is used to drive the polygon pouring mode. Clicking on the menu shows us the various options. Don't pour over same net objects, pour over all same net objects, and pour over same net polygons only. Each of these choices affect what the copper pour flows over and what it does not. Setting it to Don't pour over same net objects, will put copper over the board, but will not connect to any of the tracks or the other polygons of the same net name. Here's an example. With a polygon board, notice that it does not touch the existing ground track between C3 and C4. Double clicking on the polygon to open its properties window, let's change the pouring mode to pour over same net polygons only. This also will not connect to the track, but if there were other ground net polygons, it would connect to them. Let's add another polygon associated with ground to show this effect. You might use the Don't Pour Over Same Net option to allow for isolating polygon pores and to allow for adding tracks to connect them manually. One other option is the Remove Dead Copper checkbox. Clicking on that will remove any isolated copper islands. As expected, the pour over all same net objects allows the copper of the polygon to flow over tracks and all the other same named objects. You might have noticed at the top of the polygon property window the fill mode section. I normally use the solid option, but there are two others, hatched and none. Checking the hatched option and clicking OK, we see the polygon report. There are a number of settings for the hatch mode, including track width, grid size, pad surrounds, and various angles for the hatching. Consider trying them to see these effects. Using a hatched fill allows for a lighter PCB, as it's not 100% metal coverage, and can be used to lower the layer coverage average if needed. The none, as in outlines only option, looks like this when it's used. 
One PCB preference setting that I recommend is under the PCB General Editing Options, the Shift Click to Select Primitives window option, having both Polygons and Region checkboxes checked. This allows for polygons to be selected only when holding down the Shift key before left mouse clicking on it. This helps when working on the PCB with polygons poured. By avoiding the simple click select confusion between a polygon and a component or a track. With this preference set up, holding the Shift key prior to clicking on the polygon region will allow us to select it. Now, with it selected, we can change its shape by clicking on an edge to move it, or if a major change is needed to the shape, the endpoints can be moved and allow for complex shapes. One other modification that's possible with the polygon. While it's selected is to hold a control key down and then select the midpoint. This effectively adds another endpoint so you can create very different shaped polygons by adding additional segments. While placing a polygon, we can change the line mode by holding the shift key and tapping the spacebar, like so. One more useful feature is to add a polygon pour cutout. This prevents polygon pores in fixed regions, say for example around an RF PCB based antenna. We will go ahead and place this on the top and on the bottom layers. I will just actually copy the existing one that we drew on the top and put it onto the bottom layer. So now you can see what it looks like with the polygon pore cut out on top and bottom. Now that we have some polygons overlapping on the same layer with one having a different net assigned to it, we should look at the Polygon Manager. Opening up the Polygon Manager can be done from the Tools drop-down menu, selecting Polygon Pores and then Polygon Manager. This opens up the Polygon Manager window. This window has a number of entries, the significant one being the name of the polygons. If you recall, we allowed the Auto Naming option, which generated unique names for each polygon that we placed. You can shelve a polygon by checking its shelved checkbox. This hides the polygon but does not delete it. To unshelve it, we can either reopen the Polygon Manager or right click on an existing polygon to bring up the menus for polygons and select Polygon Actions. Then we could open up the Polygon Manager and uncheck the box. The Polygon Manager also shows the order that the polygons will be poured. This is important as a poured polygon will block other polygons from pouring over the existing copper. To change the order, simply select and click on Move Up or Down as desired. Now the resulting pours will be different due to their order of pouring having been changed. As I mentioned earlier when we were looking at the View Configuration window, we could also have hidden the polygon by clicking on the Show Hide tab and selecting Hidden for the polygons. This visually gets them out of the way and can be an aid during routing and placement with existing polygons. As with all things PCB, rules rule, and the polygons are no exception. Opening up the PCB Rules and Constraints Editor window, we can see under the Plane category, there are connection rules for both power planes and polygons. Looking at the Polygon Connect rule, we can see a number of options. At the higher level, the Connect style allows for relief connections, direct connections, and no connect. The normal setup uses relief, which allows for soldered parts to have a smaller copper connection to the larger copper plane. This facilitates soldering or unsoldering of the components. Direct connect flows the copper right over the connections, and no connect does what you expect. No metal connection is made. Looking at the clearance rule and checking the advanced option, we can now specify the clearance for polygons as well. As always, Having the rules in place prior to needing them is a good idea. Switching gears, let's look at a PCB with power planes. Here we have a layer stack with two power planes and two signal planes. We first should set the net assignments for each of the planes. Clicking on the ground plane tab, we focus the PCB on that power plane layer. Using the mouse button and double left clicking on the plane opens up a window where we can set the net assignment using the pull down menu. Likewise, on the power plane layer, we would also assign that power plane to the 5 volt net. Now, looking closer, we can see the automatic connections on these planes to the pins with the same net name. What if you need more than one power plane voltage? In this design, we have 12 volts, 5 volts, and 3.3 volt power nets. 
Given the power and the distribution of the 12 volt and 5 volt nets, we will use the power plane layer to distribute both. To split the power plane to provide 12 and 5 volt regions, simply enclose or divide the power plane using lines, not tracks, drawn to create the subregions. I would normally start the planning by using the PCB panel, selecting the 12 volt net to highlight all the pins to facilitate the creation and the visualization of the needed 12 volt split power plane region. After creating the new region, we would then double click on that region and select the 12 volt net. Editing the split planes is possible by navigating to the plane and selecting and adjusting the drawn lines. It can help to use the single layer viewing mode to reduce the visible layers while adjusting the lines that define the split plane. Just as a side note, having the internal power planes will require adding vias and connections to the surface mount parts for making connections. In this example, a polygon pour was added to the top for the 5 volts, both as a means of connection and for heat dissipation from the 5 volt regulator IC. Now that we have polygons and or power planes on the PCB, we can look at adding stitching vias to the PCB. Via stitching provides for lower impedance paths as well as a thermal path when used with copper pores, either polygons or power planes. Adding stitching is straightforward. Click on the tools, via stitching, and then add stitching to net. This opens up the window where we can set a number of the parameters. I will use the default via, but this could be changed here as well. We will need to pick the net to add the vias to and the layers. I will keep the full layer stack and select 5 volts for this net name. The placement of the via stitching group can be automatic or constrained to a particular area. Clicking on the constrain area allows for mouse driven area selection. We will use the auto feature for this example. The grid spacing and stagger row options further drive the number and placement of the vias. Clicking OK adds the vias as seen here. Looking at an RF chain example, PCB, we can illustrate the adding of shielding to a net. With top and bottom polygon pores connected to ground, we will add shielding to the RF chain. Clicking on Tools, via Stitching Shielding, Add Shielding, we will get a pop-up window for setting up the shielding tool. We can either add shielding to the nets in the chain, one at a time, or if, and that's a big if, we had already selected all the nets in the chain before starting the tool, we could add shielding to them all. We will add shielding to one of the nets to illustrate the basic operation, and then we use the PCB panel to go back and select the RF class of nets, thereby selecting all of the nets in the RF chain for adding shielding to. We can check the Selected Objects box. Note there are a lot of options when adding shielding to nets, just like there were for stitching. We can change the row spacing, number of rows. We can add shielding copper if, if copper does not exist. And we can, in fact, change the vias used. Let's go ahead and add to the rest of the chain the shielding necessary.